Um, so welcome to our April Coffee Hour, our monthly series. Um, my name is Agnieszka Carpenter and I'm the Executive Director of Biomain. Uh, if you're not familiar with our organization, Biomain is Bioscience Association of Maine. We're a trade industry group devoted to creating opportunities for life science community in Maine and beyond. Um, and today's coffee hour um, is somehow centered around innovation, although it was not on purpose, but it just happened. So I'm very excited. Um, you know, April is a pretty busy month for us. We give out a lot of scholarships, both for college students and middle school students. So we've been pretty busy reviewing applications, but it's a really great initiative. Um, and you'll be getting some emails if you're on our email list about who we give it to and why. Um, but today um, I'm excited to present four speakers. And just before we start, we will start in a, a minute or so, um, a couple of logistics. The chat function is on. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. Um, we will have four 10 minute presentations and then towards the end, we'll devote about 10 to 15 minutes to Q&A. Um, you can either type your, question, type your question in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand towards the end and ask the question in person, which we encourage you to do that. Um, and if you just wanna say hi or say who you are in the chat or anything new with you, please do so as well. If you're excited about your COVID vaccine, we're, we're welcoming those messages as well. Okay, um, so without further ado, um, I also wanted to thank the sponsors, almost forgot. So these events are possible thanks to our generous annual sponsors um, and all of our sponsors are listed on this page. Um, thank you so much if anybody from these institutions are with us today. Um, you know, we couldn't do what we're doing without you. And I will stop my share now. Okay, and our first speaker today is Susan Ahern. She is the Vice President of Innovation at Maine Health. And she's doing some amazing things at Maine Health. Um, so we're, we're excited to have her today, Susan. Great, thank you everyone. Can you hear me okay? And see the screen, we're good to go? All right, well, thank you, Agnesha. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Susan Ahern, VP of Innovation. And um, it's a new, the Innovation Center is one year old. Uh, and it's, we have a tagline that it's the connective tissue between education, research and care. Uh, my background is I've been in the innovation entrepreneurial ecosystem my whole career, graduated from Colby, my husband's from Maine, uh, worked for the Consulate General of Canada in Boston, as well as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and co-founded a, a couple of companies. So I, it's, I'm an, excited to be in Maine and honored to be at Maine Health. The next 10 minutes, we'll do a quick overview of the Maine Health the Center and invite you to come collide with us. So just briefly, um, Maine Health is the largest and only academic healthcare organization in Maine and New Hampshire with an academic and research institute. We are recognized as one of the top um, nation's top integrated healthcare delivery networks. And with a network of 22,000 care team members strong, we are the largest network of expertly trained clinicians, researchers, and administrative leaders and care team members north of Boston. We are content experts in care who see opportunities that need solving. We have a passion for community and an eye for the future. So just uh, in the past year, it was, a, um, it was a decision by the Maine Health Board to put together the Innovation Center. And so over the last few uh, months, we've defined innovation as a novel idea that solves an unmet care need, it's a care team model. It could be a process or it could be a product. And over the last year, you know, obviously it's, uh, it takes a village to make innovation work. So we've been spending the time building relationships and building trust across, uh, across the ecosystem. So for example, we work with the University of Maine. We just signed a master's agreement with them um, and working with the US Scent as our prototyping um, shop. So we have a whole engineering department. Um, who's helping our innovators move forward. We work closely with Maine Angels. We've, we work with MTI, who's helped fund a number of our innovators. 
as well as the Maine Center for Entrepreneurship um, to help build a bio cluster here in Maine. And obviously we're working with um, BioMaine as well. So for the last uh, year or so, we've also designed and implemented a four core programs to help support our innovators. So our services at the Innovation Center is to really to educate, to connect, and to fund. So the, the four core programs, we have a cohort, which is uh, if you take a back of the envelope idea and you want to move it forward. We've been asked to help um, teach colleagues how to think differently. So we have a Tufts University School of Medicine approved innovation elective. We work closely with the Rue Institute because we have the care expertise and we're, we're, we're doing a brainstorming session with Rue to bring in AI, machine learning, and big data to accelerate innovation there. And we also launched an innovation fund. You know, it takes a little bit of seed money to move an idea forward. So those are our four core programs currently. I just want to share our innovation fund, which we launched this fall. Here are some of the projects that we funded. One of them in particular that I'd love to highlight is Deb Flint. Uh, you see the cloth headband. She's a respiratory therapist up in um, Aldo County, and she's been working with patients who wears the oxygen, uh, has an oxygen tank. And the tubing around the ears always causes infections. And so she said, how can we, how can we prevent this? So she went, got cloth, her sewing machine, and created a headband, as well as loops to lift the oxygen tubing off of the, the back of the ears to help prevent um, infection, which we think is great. And so our colleague, who is Deb Dubois, who is president of Care at Home, had her come present at um, with her team to, again, get feedback, make iterations, and, and advance the design. We were connected with our linen colleagues who connected us with a global supply chain who designs hospital um, garments to help further the innovation as well. So it's, as you know, it's always about the connective tissue. So it's, a, it's great some of the innovation that's coming along here. I also wanted to share the World Diabetic Retinopathy Screening down at the bottom. The idea is um, colleagues in our rural countries were saying, you know, as a family doc, we have 1,300 patients we need to treat. There's one of the optometrists left. And so because diabetes is a major issue in Maine, um, they're bringing in a screening tool with artificial intelligence to help screen patients and then um, um, identify the, the level of need for the diabetic training. To me, this is an additional care team, new care team model that helps our patients, it helps our care team members um, to, and, and take care of our colleagues here. So that's a great um, innovation. I wanted to share briefly that we are located at, on the fifth floor of Maine General Building in Portland, and we're also have an external collaboration and site at Root at WEX that we welcome you to. So that's, that's just briefly what we have. And we also have a brewing coffee corners for everyone to zoom in on the first and third Wednesdays of the month, you know, come, come meet, come collide. And we're also, this is the innovation blender. We have Anne Brezier from the Research Institute who's uh, presenting today on transforming the biobanks. So we welcome you to join as well. So thanks for the time and it's great to meet everyone. Thank you so much, Susan. I am so excited that Maine Health um, hired you. I think you're a great asset for Maine. And um, I actually forgot that Anne Bergia is presenting today. Can we still um, register for that event? Absolutely, yes. Okay, I'm totally doing that. For anybody who doesn't know, Dr. Anne Bergia is also on our board and she's amazing. So if you have some time at noon, um, I invite you to join that meeting. I certainly will. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. If anybody has questions, once again, please leave them in the chat. Um, and we will move to our next speaker, and that's Dr. Magdalena Blaszkiewicz, the co-founder and president and CEO of New Right. Magda. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting New Right today, Agnieszka. Um, and our core company team is consists of me um, as well as our co-founder Christy Townsend and our co-owner and president uh, Derek Houtman. Uh, the mission of 
Neurite is to create superior quality diagnostics for the detection of small fiber peripheral neuropathy while striving to develop novel treatment and therapeutic options for the condition in transparent, data-driven, and patient-centric manner. Now, the problem our company addresses is peripheral neuropathy, which is caused by over 30 medical conditions, which includes diabetes, aging, um, chemotherapy, certain viral infections such as HIV. And there are over, over 100 million people currently diagnosed with diabetes and prediabetes, and that's just the US alone. And we think those numbers are greatly um, underestimated. 60 to 70% of all diabetics will develop some form of peripheral neuropathy. There's currently no cure for peripheral neuropathy, and there's also no reliable diagnosis for small fiber neuropathy, which would allow for mitigation of early stages of the disease. The direct cost to patients, and these are estimates from 2014, so they're probably much higher right now, um, but at that time, the direct cost to patients was over $2,000 per year. The direct cost to payers was over 6,000 and the indirect costs, the loss of productivity, oftentimes peripheral neuropathy patients end up losing their jobs and going on disability because they can no longer work, were estimated to be about 19,000 per year. So if we take into account the 20 million peripheral neuropathy patients, that equals billions of annual costs every year. And this, this little a bit little striking image is really not propaganda. Patients with neuropathy have extreme pain um, and we'll talk a little more about those symptoms in the next few slides. So um, through our academic research, we've discovered the peripheral neuropathy doesn't just extend to loss of nerves in the skin, but goes deeper to subcutaneous or under the skin levels, which include fat and muscles. And this happens due to just natural aging, um, certain diets, as well as obesity and diabetes. Now, especially because um, of the aging and obesity and diabetes, which are disproportionate in Maine compared to the rest of the country. This is a problem in the state of Maine that it probably affects more people per capita than it does in, in other states. So we think it's a very relative, relevant condition to the state of Maine. <clears throat> Some of the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy include pain, numbness, bur burning and tingling of hands, the face, feet, or legs, depending on the effective area. Uh, some patients report feeling like they're being electrocuted. Eventually it leads to loss of sensation and loss of tissue function. Now, when the loss of tissue function becomes very severe, this could lead to limb amputation. Specific to loss of nerves in the subcutaneous fat layer underneath the skin, this breaks down communication between the brain and fat tissue, which will lead to an increase in fat mass and affect uh, energy expenditure by decreasing fuel burning, which worsens the metabolic state. Okay, the current methods for diagnosis, there are many, but I'm only going to go through some of the gold standards that are being used by neurologists. And the first here is a sural nerve biopsy, where a piece of the sural nerve is surgically removed and sent away for biopsy processing. This can um, detect axonal degeneration and demyelination. However, the problem here is the sural nerve, it's a large nerve, so it doesn't assess small fiber neuropathy, which is often the first stage in peripheral neuropathy. The second is just um, a skin punch biopsy. So a small piece of skin is removed and using a tool that rotates through the skin and takes out some skin along with a little bit of subcutaneous fat underneath. This is able to assess neuropathy, but can only see morphological changes. So it does not speak to nerve function, which is thought to be the first thing that's effective, affected. And then the last is electromyography. So here we have needle electrodes that are inserted directly into the muscle, um, oftentimes in the forearm, um, by the ankle, sometimes a little further up the calf. This will measure electrical activity in response to stimulation of the muscle. This will determine nerve function. So it's, it's a good assessment of nerve health. However, it is targeted for larger nerves. So it is not useful for small fiber peripheral neuropathy. So the bottom line with the diagnostic problem is um, diagnosing neuropathy can be invasive with biopsies. Um, electromyography can oftentimes be painful and uh, it's a costly process. There is no functional assessment for small fiber neuropathy available at this time. 
And that brings us to our solution. So our device will provide a more sensitive detection and an earlier diagnosis via skin surface nerve conduction measurements. And in this diagram, you can see our device sits directly on the surface of the skin with microelectrodes penetrating through it. And this will monitor nerves as they become affected and die back. So our minimum viable product we're calling the DEN. This is the, it stands for detecting early neuropathy. This is the diagnostic component of the device. Our full platform is a theragnostic and we're in the middle, we're uh, actively developing that. So just to um, sum up our solution to the peripheral neuropathy diagnosis problem, our um, technology can provide an earlier reliable diagnosis through a sensitive measurement of nerve activity, which will provide a functional assessment for small fiber neuropathy. It will be portable, wireless, quantitative, and minimally invasive. It's capable, the full diagnostic platform will, or theragnostic platform will be capable of delivering treatments, therapies, as well as collecting data to better understand the different causes of neuropathy. So, um, our bottom line, our device aims to improve diagnostic time and accuracy, and this will save healthcare dollars for both patients and clinicians. And it provides a means of delivering peripheral neuropathy treatments as they become available. And the other thing that that's not often talked about with um, diagnostics when you're thinking about a financial bottom line is the quality of life to the patient. With an, with an earlier diagnosis and a faster process to getting a diagnosis, the quality of life is greatly improved. And um, our product applications in a nutshell, the device can measure baseline nerve conductance from healthy nerves. So it provides a way of monitoring nerve health. It will detect neuropathy as the nerves, nerve function degenerates, and it will um, be able to deliver treatments as they become available and monitor nerve regrowth. So just a little um, back on how we got started. We first started um, assembling our research and development team at the University of, of Maine, where we had our, our prototype de device developed. That was back in 2018, 2019. We were part of the UMaine's MRTA Accelerator inaugural cohort, which um, led us to getting an MIT seed grant that has greatly helped us progress to founding the company in towards the end of 2018 as um, an academic spin out and biotech startup. Uh, we took part in the ITREP program at University of Vermont, L, as well as the Top Gun program back in 2019 and won the, um, the Shaw Prize. And um, we started uh, holding office space at the Uptart, Upstart Center for Entrepreneurship in Orono, Maine. In 2019, we received a COPRI pilot award to further the technology and do preliminary preclinical studies, filed our provisional patent last year, and are preparing to file our full patent this year. And uh, we also received an NSF STTR phase one award in 2020, um, which will help us finish off preclinical studies and move to our initial human testing. And we've just completed an NSF i 2021 um, training program, which was greatly beneficial to uh, understanding the needs of our future customers. So the, the full Neurite team includes neurobiologists, and that's myself and Dr. Christy Townsend, as well as Dr. Leonard Cass at UMaine, who's our lead neurophysiologist. We have amazing engineers at UMaine, and the lead engineer is Dr. Rosemary Smith. She's a biomedical um, engineer and also an expert in microfabrication of uh, microneedles and microneedle arrays. Um, so she's uh, working on the lead engineering aspects of the technology along with Dr. Nuri Amantalu and uh, Dr. Ali Abedi. And then on the um, business and management side, the person who takes care of numbers because we don't really like to deal with that. We've got Derek Houtman and he takes care of all of our um, management and he's uh, our CFO and COO at, at the moment. We also have three research assistants working at the University of Maine right now, um, a couple of contract workers, two consultants, and a board of business advisors and science and medical advisors. So our 
immediate, these are the pared down steps, but like their immediate next steps we have include setting up partnerships in Maine. So these will include manufacturing partners, um, as well as building our intellectual resources. So hiring Maine talent um, and re retaining it in um, our headquarters in Orono, as well as setting up clinical trial sites. We think Maine is a perfect one, um, site to do our early clinical trials just because of how disproportionately the population could be affected by peripheral neuropathy. And in the next um, two to six months, we'll be filing our full patent and getting IRB approval to do the initial human testing to optimize the device for human skin. Within a year, we hope to have secured manufacturers that can manufacture uh, small batch devices that will be FDA compliant. And then hopefully in a year or two, we'll have FDA clearance and be setting up larger clinical trials, which will include testing in a diabetic population and uh, partnering with neurologists as our early adopters of the technology. So I'd just like to thank um, some of the amazing groups and people in Maine who have helped develop this technology and our company, and that includes MTI and the TAP program, um, Tony Perkins, who's been great legal counsel. Uh, Gary Goodrich has recently been our i mentor and has agreed to stay on to continue mentoring us as we grow the business. Um, MC and Top Gun, Upstart Center in the town of Orno, who supported us and allowed us to maintain a presence in Maine. And of course, Renee Kelly and Vina, Dinesh at UMaine who uh, helped us translate the idea into a commercializable technology, as well as MDIBL and um, Bangor Savings Bank for their um, funding help. And I think that's everything. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Magda. I just want to say that Maine is proud of you guys. I've been watching New Rights progress and it's just so great to see how you took the idea and you're just mind blowing and congratulations on all the awards. I think very well deserved. And it's so exciting to see um, what's, what the future holds for you. I wish you all success. And once again, any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I also just wanted to go back to um, um, Susan's presentation, someone asked about the link to join the meeting at 12 today um, with Dr. Bergia. So that link is in the chat if you're interested. Okay, um, our next speaker today is Kate Green, founder and CEO of Owls Head Solutions. Um, and Kate, whenever you're ready. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Agnieszka, for having me here today and to everyone. Um, really excited to tell you a little bit about Owl's Head Solutions. Um, I think this presentation will be different than what you might expect at a coffee hour um, because out of all of the members of Biomain, we're the only creative agency. So uh, our expertise really uh, in this business revolves around telling your story in an impactful way. So. I'm going to share my screen just for a couple of slides. So as I mentioned, I'm Kate Green. I'm the CEO of Allison Solutions. So we are a uh, full service branding design and development agency specializing in life sciences, um, healthcare, health advocacy, and sexual reproductive health and rights. And uh, I'm also very proud to say that we are women owned and women led. So we have worked alongside research agencies um, such as the CDC, the Population Council, RTI International, as well as pharma companies such as Janssen, um, IDEX, uh, AstraZeneca to break down a complicated story, disseminate, disseminate crucial health data and, and spin that into a visual that anyone can understand. And so how we focus our efforts really depends on where you are in your growth cycle. So um, where you are in your research and development and which audience members you're trying to reach at that particular moment in time. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about for a bit today, just some, some brand and messaging strategies to consider when you're shaping your efforts. Um, when you're just starting up versus maybe when you're going into phase three clinical trials. 
And so um, first things first, stop sharing. Um, you know, as we all know, Maine's a really exciting place to be uh, in life sciences because we're attracting a lot of talent and we're creating a lot of new startups. Uh, and what does every startup need to, to get going? Money. <laughs> and so who is your audience uh, when you're asking for money? Uh, investors, right? So you need to think about with your branding, what are investors looking at um, as they're deciding whether or not they're going to take you seriously? It's about your approach. It's about your science. It's about your credibility. And it's about your pipeline. And they need to know that you're serious. So the design of your website, the design of your PowerPoint presentations, your poster presentations, or even your LinkedIn um, you know, background profile image, it really speaks volumes towards whether or not you should be taken seriously or dismissed from the start. So you know, these days with wearable tech and social media, good design is ubiquitous. So it's expected everywhere. And that includes your industry as well. So I came prepared with a few examples to, to sort of help frame what your design considerations should be from an early stage startup through some companies that are slightly more established. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Can everybody see that, Janarian? I'm going to just refresh it so you can see the, the little animation. But anyway, this is Janarian. Um, they are a startup. They're working to discover therapies that amplify the body's natural biological networks to reverse disease course. And so upon launch, they had three primary goals um, to, to elevate their unique ability to create new medicines in an entirely different way, uh, to capture their deep expertise, and to connect with investors and partners who want to help advance the science discovery and impact of their mission. So notice that all of these goals really revolve around attracting interest, building credibility and trust. And that's the story that you want to tell at this stage. So to tell that story for this particular client, um, you know, we highlighted beautifully stylized scientific visuals paired with like large bold statements. Um, as you scroll down the site, we're featuring images of scientists. Uh, we're featuring images of scientific illustrations that give a very sort of quick overview of their program. Um, we're highlighting quotes from key uh, leadership team members. So all of these visual cues are working in concert with each other to again reinforce our message over and over again that we're credible, that our science is solid, you should partner with us, you should invest in us. Um, so I'm going to look at another sample now. Um, let's say you've secured investors, you've attracted some talent, you've got a drug or multiple drugs moving through your pipeline, and maybe you're about to enter phase three clinical trials. Who's your audience now? Things have sort of changed a little bit, right? And now you're going to be talking to media, you're going to be talking to uh, the healthcare industry at large, you're going to be talking to other pharma companies who you might want to purchase your tech, you, you're going to be talking to, uh, in a certain, to a certain extent, the, the customer or the, or the patient. Um, so you have to pivot a bit. And uh, we have to really humanize your story at this point, because after all, it's not just about the science, but it's about the patient, right? So when you're telling a patient story, you need to take a slightly different visual approach and um, change the tone in a few areas. And there, there are different levels that you can dial it up and dial it down. And so this, this site, particularly Kira, um, we dialed it up just a little bit. So we're staying true to the science and we're talking about the science again. We're showing the illustrations, but here we're starting to, to weave in photos of the patients to show patient centricity. Um, and, Kira actually launched with a, a slimmed down version of this website. And during their investor cycle, they were able to secure 53.5 million in Series B funding. So um, we then 
updated things slightly before JP Morgan Healthcare Conference in January to really uh, adapt for their newer audience. And so, yeah, you can see that there's just, there's a bit more humanity um, in this design. But again, we're talking about credibility. We're showing the team, um, the investors, news about them. Um, and I know we only have a couple more minutes, but the last one I want to show, the last example is the, the U and ME registry. Um, it's about ME, CFS, um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Don't ask me what ME stands for. I can never pronounce it, but it's chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and this particular site is all about the patient because they're not actually designing a drug here. They're creating a patient registry to... Um, to have people who have been diagnosed with CFS join a community, track their symptoms on an app um, so that we can gain funding for this disease state, um, gain media attention. So, you know, the same sort of rules apply, however, in connecting with your audience and making sure that you're presenting the right tone and the right message at the right time. So here we're featuring patients front and center. Um, and we basically want the user to immediately relate to these patients and feel like they're being welcome into the community. Um, so no images of couples holding hands and walking on the beach or doing their hobby. Um, you know, this is really about the portraits. They're looking directly at you and they're urging you to engage. Um, We've got some infographics on how the registry works. And then further down the page, we have some patient videos, again, addressing you directly. Um, <clears throat> and um, as you keep going, we've got, we show the number of uh, current participant, participants in the registry, which again, it builds credibility, it builds trust. And this site's only about a year old and they've got over 3000 registered registrants at this point, which is really not bad. Um, so typically when I have this discussion, the first thing people ask is, okay, well, how, how much should I be prepared to invest? You know, we're a startup, we're trying to stay lean. Um, and I would say, you know, we've got a pretty good sense at this point, we've done a lot of these. Um, we have a good sense of what it takes. And I think you should be ready to budget a minimum of $50,000. That's going to give you a really good foundation. It's going to give you your logo, colors, fonts, a starter website, which might just be like a long scroller, like the Kira one you saw, um, PowerPoint templates, stationery, and some social platform graphics so that at every touch point when you're talking to your audiences, they're going to see a unified, um, they're going to see a unified system. And in terms of timing, you want to plan somewhere between four and six months. It's not a, it's, you know, you got to do it, you got to do it right. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, I've got about a minute left. I could keep talking about this, but if you do want to talk offline uh, with me about what's happening with your brand, what's happening with your outreach, I'd be happy to chat. I think Agnish is going to be sharing our contact information, but you can you can get me on LinkedIn um, and you can check out our website as well at owlsheadsolutions.com. See some of our latest case studies. Um, we do more than branding. We do everything that comes with it. So infographics, social media graphics, videos, interactive web experiences. Um, so, so at every level of where you're at, we're, we're basically able to support that, that we, we specialize in healthcare and this is what we do all day, every day. So. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kate. That was fascinating. I always find marketing fascinating. Um, and did you guys know that this company exists in Maine? <laughs> we first met Kate at our um, December holiday mixer. And when she spoke just for a minute, I thought, wow, this is really great for our coffee hour. So I'm so glad that we had her here today. And also, also thank you for talking money. I think that's something that's not always publicly discussed, but it's good to have an idea. So if anybody's interested in connecting with Kate, um, you know, there are a lot of marketing and branding companies around, but not all of them have the right expertise for you. So um, feel free to contact us. We'll share the contact information as uh, Kate mentioned. 
Um, okay, so now uh, it's time to get to our last speaker today, and it's Christine Logan, the director of Tech Place and um, MRA. And Christine has some exciting updates for us, um, and hopefully, we can all meet at the Tech Place soon at some point. I would love that. Looking forward to it. So, good morning, and uh, Ganishka, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about what we're doing here in Brunswick to support. Uh, the biotech industry and the growth of biotech companies in general. So everybody can see the screen. I was having a little troubles earlier. Good. So Tech Place um, is a technology incubator. I'm going to give a quick background of how we got just to that place. I work for the Midcoast Regional Redevelopment Authority, and we are charged with redeveloping the former Naval Air Station in Brunswick that was closed back in 2005. And in part of our redevelopment efforts, uh, we realized that we were able to accommodate very large companies on the property, which is now called the Brunswick Landing. Uh, but when we were approached by smaller companies, early stage startups that just needed um, small manufacturing space or an office space, that we didn't have anything to offer them. And when we tried to refer them out in town, there wasn't space um, for us to do that either. So we decided to take one of the existing military buildings that was transferred to us, um, which is a, just under 100,000 square feet, and turn it into a shared space for manufacturing technology companies. And our focus is on uh, biotech, clean technologies, aviation and aerospace, um, IT, and composites. Let's see, I'm just gonna advance. Um, so what, like I said, we focus on all of those. Um, one of them is the biotech sector. So within Tech Place, um, we offer several things to support early stage companies. We have the co-working spaces, office space. Um, we all share the same network and office equipment. There's access to programs and resources. Some of those are in-house. We have the um, Manufacturing Extension Partnership located at Tech Place, as well as uh, Maine PTAC, which is the Procurement and Technical Assistance Center. We have an entrepreneur in residence, uh, John Carp, that comes and works with many of our, our entrepreneurs. Um, and then we have one of the bigger things that we have um, to offer early stage companies is our prototyping labs. And we found that one of the biggest obstacles to early stage companies is being able to raise enough capital or have access to equipment that's needed for early stage R&D or prototyping. So within our facility, we have a full composite layup facility for our composite companies. Uh, machine shops to do prototype work for some of our other manufacturers and a full bioproduction facility for our biotech companies. Just a couple photos, the facility. So our bioproduction lab, um, this we also partnered with uh, MTI and they provided our funding to purchase all of our equipment in the bioproduction facility. So again, um, companies can come in, they can rent a bench space and have access to all the equipment. Um, we have a lab manager, and I don't know if some of you may know him, but Dr. Jem Gire, and he oversees our lab and, um, and onboards new users. Take a little bit of time. I'm not going to read through them, but you can see them. So, like I said, some of the big obstacles was that folks did not have access to or couldn't afford to buy all of their own equipment. Um, and so, along with MTI, we were able to purchase a lot of shared equipment um, and allow people to have access and do R and D. And we probably have had about. Um, mm, eight or 10 bio companies come through main, or come through Tech Place, and I'll share a little bit about those in just a little bit. Uh, so here's a couple, I'm gonna go through, because I feel that one of the things that can tell our story best is the companies that have started here in Tech Place and have grown. 
Um, one of the things that when we first opened Tech Place, we weren't sure the mix of people that we would get in terms of um, the stages that they were at. We thought we might get all a lot of millennials wanting to develop apps of something. And, and we have found that uh, we have a great mix of ages. Um, we have several millennials, but we have a lot of folks that have located into our incubator that are um, in the later part of their careers that they have worked with in their industry and found where the pain points are and um, discovered ways that they feel they can solve problems. And so they have located at Tech Place. We also, the other part that's really neat is um, these companies are not all from Maine. Um, many have moved out of garages or bedrooms or their, you know, the sheds where they were working and, and working on a new um, manufacturing product. But many of them have come uh, from out of the state and some out of the country. So we have folks from these folks here um, for field phytonutrients are actually from Connecticut. Uh, we have a business from Chicago and from Kansas, many from Massachusetts, um, as well as entrepreneurs that have come and started companies and relocated and expanded US operations from both Finland, uh, Switzerland, and actually Australia. So it's been a nice mix. And I think part of being in a place like Tech Place is that sharing of, we call them collisions of innovation where folks are in the same space and are able to share supply chains and where they've gotten funding, how they've hired folks. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit about the companies to give an idea of the types of businesses that we're able to support at Tech Place. Um, this company, Field Phytonutrients, and some of these you may recognize as they've been in the system of resources and worked with MTI or Mitzi or some of the other folks and Biomain. Um, this company is, again, a couple out of Connecticut that have moved here, and they work with um, processing algae to make a enzyme that goes into cat, dog, and fish products, and they curse currently have commercialized their product. And they're also looking to eventually make this and putting their product into human product as well. The New England Ocean um, Oceanographic Laboratory is located at Tech Place. Um, they look at uh, a lot of ocean sciences, obviously looking and studying the past, present and future states of the ocean and the changing conditions and how those changes impact the environment. Soil Carbon is one of our newest companies. This company is actually based out of um, Australia and they have headquarters in Minnesota. And they are currently here in the US to do their R&D. Um, so they're using our lab here and they're really looking at um, efforts related to the development and launch of microbial seed treatments used by farmers to enhance their carbon sequestration for agricultural operations. So we are excited to, to have them here at Tech Place. I mentioned um, uh, Jem Gire, and that is him there in the photo. And he has a company called Salmonix that is located here at Tech Place, and he also manages our lab. Uh, Salmonix kind of, they take um, agricultural waste from salmon and um, that take that waste product into a sustainable resource for uh, making high quality reagents. So I want to mention one thing while we're talking, because a lot of these you can see are, are based in some kind of sustainability for either agriculture or for um, um, healthcare products. One of our big focuses on the Brunswick Landing in general is sustainability. And I guess I will also share that um, our entire campus, including Tech Place, is run on 100% renewable energy sources as part of our sustainability promise. And we are working towards being able to produce 100% of that energy on site. Um, and so, we have a very reliable energy source. Uh, we currently we currently generate about 70% of our own energy through a anaerobic digester and a solar farm. And then we purchase wind power is our gap. 
So um, a lot of our companies also appreciate and like to have that as part of their selling point that they run on 100% renewable power. And Sphero is actually a company based out of Switzerland and they, uh, they make a five species assay that is used by pharmaceutical companies all around the world. They actually have a, a lab that's attached to our shared lab here. They do most of their manufacturing in their own lab and then bring it into the shared facility where they um, are able to have access to the equipment in there. So this is just one slide that I wanna share about um, what we're looking at into the future. And uh, this was done with the help of SMRT. And I think Fran is on this um, call as well. And so Fran and her team have been instrumental in helping us put together these, the idea and the design along with Consigli uh, for what we want to have as a future life science center here at the Brunswick Landing. What we have learned, and especially through the state of the industry report that was put out by Biomain really helped guide us in the fact that we have gotten a quite a few um, each year, even more and more um, inquiries about space for biotech companies and bigger space than what we have at Tech Place. So we started to think, well, we would really like to be able to have a shared lab and life science center. So this is a rendering that was put together of um, what that would look like. Um, not exactly, because we might do a second story, but um, an example of some of the lab space. Um, again, it would be individual labs, as well as partially some shared lab space with equipment that could be um, used by everybody, and then office spaces and meeting spaces. So. We're excited about where we can go in the future. Um, this will probably be a 2022 project. And uh, we've had a lot of input both from MCE and, um, and from Biomain and from industry. So we are also open for any other comments or questions about this future project and, and guidance. So um, that's kind of my presentation about what we do at Tech Place. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Lots of activity in the chat right now, uh, spurred by the Tech Place um, new development. I am personally so excited about this uh, new Life Science Center. Um, it'll be great to see it come to life. Um, and so we'll start with the questions. And Christine, I'll start with you because your presentation is the freshest on our minds. Um, so the first question is, is an appointment needed to visit Tech Place? Um, and this is from Bobby Lamont. Um, would she would like to schedule a visit with other main angels and a beer at flight deck? Talk to us. Yes. So, well, I'll say a really quick thing about the flight deck. As funny as as we've been redeveloping the Brunswick Naval Air Station to Brunswick Landing for ten years now, we just are hitting in May our ten year mark, and we had done so much and nobody had really known anything about it until flight deck opened and then it was like oh you're the place where flight deck is and wow there you go put us on the map so uh yes i would say you would need to schedule an appointment and that's just so that if you arrive i make sure that i have time to bring you around and show you the facility and i'd be happy to do that and um certainly flight deck and now wild oats bakery and cafe is here on the campus as well so just give me a call or send me an email. That's perfect. Actually, that gives me some ideas for maybe some kind of in-person event outside. So stay tuned. Christine okay. will come. Um, okay, let me go back to some questions here. Um, I saw one question for Magda that had to do with Lyme disease. Let me just find it. I apologize, it's hard to sift through all of those. Um, okay, so the question was, have you thought about peripheral neuropathy caused by Lyme disease as a possible market for your product? Lyme symptoms often come and go. Uh, it would be great to have something that could track nerve function over a long period of time. And I wanted to piggyback on this question and also ask about COVID-related neuropathy and if that's a market for you. 
Yes, so both of those are markets because of the way our device works. It um, assesses nerve function over time, so it could be used as a screening tool. We're focusing on the diabetic market because that's the largest market right now, but it, the device can detect any neuropathy that has nerve function affected. And right now we're seeing a quick rise in COVID-related peripheral neuropathies, and we're still not sure what the cause there is. Uh, same thing for Lyme disease, and there are other environmental exposures, even certain antibiotics lead to can lead to peripheral neuropathy, but we're still trying to understand the causes, and hopefully that could come out of the research that we foresee being able to do as the product develops. Perfect. Great to see so many uses for it. Um, okay, another quick question is for Kate Green. Um, Kate, this is a question from Christy Townsend. Kate, uh, wonderful to hear, to learn about your work for life science companies with a web presence, especially new and small. What are some strategies for them to speak to multiple audiences, such as patients, investors, fellow scientists, potential business, strategic partners on the site? Um, yeah, so. Yeah. No, that's a great question um, because yeah, there's your early stages, there's opportunity everywhere, right? So, um, but I think, I mean, there's a couple of ways to, to think about it. Um, you can have your audience enter at different points in the site. So it really comes down to like hierarchy. I think at some point you really do have to make some decisions as to like, right now where I am in my needs, like who is my main audience? And then kind of decide from there on your homepage, like who, in what hierarchy do, do we start to speak to each of these audiences? And you can certainly have a section for each on the site, um, but you know, the look and feel has to be universal throughout. So, um, you know, when you work with a creative agency, just make sure that, um, they're, you know, they're sort of taking that into consideration, like holistically, um, how to address those different audiences, but, and change the tone slightly, but all under sort of the same umbrella as the, as the top level branding. So, um, it re yeah, it really comes down to, to like hierarchy and, and trying to figure out what your top needs are at that, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Kate. Um, I also wanted to ask Susan a question and Susan, you sort of answered it um, via chat, but I wanted to give you a chance to speak as well. So this is from David. Um, what is Maine Health Innovation Center doing to encourage collaboration with Maine industry? I think um, David means the Maine biotech industry and medical device. And is there room for that sort of collaboration? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're just learning and building relationships and seeing who's out there. And that's, uh, we'd love to collaborate. And it's all about advancing the innovation that's happening within Maine Health to advance care in Maine. So absolutely. And Dave, I, I wish you would just uh, take two seconds to share how you've impacted our innovators here, if, you, if you're still there. It's, it's been an amazing collaboration. Uh, yeah, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, one of your team on one involved in one of the projects there, um, you know, kind of was aware of Baker and our skills and capabilities and, um, reached out to us to help with one of the projects. Um, you know, really some of the clinicians there came up with an interesting idea about, um, uh, you know, ways to prevent spreads of, uh, airborne, diseases, I guess I'd say, um, particularly uh, urgent these days, and uh, came to Baker to partner on that. And as one of the, the identified industry partners, and we've helped to um, sort of refine the idea as well as uh, provide some testing to validate the, the system. And, and I think that's kind of moved forward through your process there and um, moving ahead soon, I think with some trial um, uh, trial period of use of the product. Yeah, the collaboration has been amazing. I mean, the expertise, we have expertise in care and everyone has expertise out to keep advancing us. And what you've, how you've helped us has been tremendous and I can't thank you enough. So, so we'd love to absolutely uh, keep expanding relationships here. 
Perfect. I actually didn't know that. And for anybody who was confused, David Eagleson is the president of the Baker Company. <laughs> I don't know if that was mentioned. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much it for the questions. I see some comments in the chat. I'm so excited that the chat has been, um, you know, active today. We're seeing that um, folks are a little bit tired of Zoom, but I feel like this event uh, was really, really great. And the chat is just the proof of that. Before we all go, if you need to go, go. Um, but I just wanted to mention our next event. So that's on April the 29th. Um, actually, April 28th and April 29th, I'm going to share my screen here. We're doing a thing called Biomain Student Showcase. And it's a competition for high school and college students. Um, and the April 29th, is the college students pitch competition. So they have three minutes to talk about their projects. It's super interesting, very exciting, you know, a good opportunity to see what college students in Maine are doing in terms of biotech research. So I encourage you to re register for that. It's on the 29th at 2 p.m. And it's going to be a, a nail biting competition. I'm sure we have exciting cash prizes for that. Um, and our next event after that is going to be in May and it's our next coffee hour and that one will be devoted to the cross between aquaculture and um, bioscience, which should be super interesting. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day today. Hopefully we won't go, we won't get the snow tomorrow. Um, and it's always great to see you all. So take care. Thank you so much for supporting us.